Some folks will like you and some that just won't. Some that stay real and some that just don't. Trying to fit in will only take you so far. You'll never find home trying to change who you are. So don't spend your whole life trying to be what you ain't. Can't hide your heart with a new coat of paint. You think they'll accept you? I promise they can't. Just be who you are. Forget what they think. So just be who you are and forget what they think. Welcome to Vet with a Mic, content driven by veteran issues. And I am so glad that during the intro, the mic mutes because I can't help but sing along to that song every single time I hear it. Um, you know, our our uh, song for the for the show is "Strung Like a Horse." Forget what they think. For those of you who haven't got a chance to check it out, but today we are talking to a buddy of mine named Irving, who is an Air Force veteran who worked on the F-15s, if I my memory serves me correctly. That's and correct. we're gonna. We're going to talk a little bit about what his life in the uniform was like and how he transitioned the great divide that is life after the uniform. Irving, my brother, how are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Man, uh, you know, it is another day, another dollar, because that's all I get paid around here. <laughs> yeah. What, what about you? Yeah. You anything exciting for the holiday? Oh, just enjoying our cold, wet Christmas. <laughs> Oh forget, yeah, right. yeah, forget about that that white Christmas with the snow. No, it's cold, right. wet, and brown. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because you're in Florida, right? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, on your last episode, you talked about Panama City Beach. That's about two hours east of me. Yeah. Well, Panama City Beach, I, that is the mecca for vacations for East Tennessee. I'm just, yep. <laughs> just gonna that, tell you. <laughs> that yeah. is a fact. Yeah. I mean, we either go there for the summertime, and then we go to Gatlinburg, Tennessee, for the winter time. Uh, so I'm okay. sure there's Gatlinburg must just be slammed right now because it's a beautiful little mountain town and there's a lot of fun stuff to do. But so let's let's talk a little bit about your life in the uniform. Uh, so I served from 2007 to 2012. I was, uh, as I said, I was in the Air Force. I worked on F-15s. I crewed C's, D's, and E's uh, over at Eglund Air Force Base. <laughs> And uh, we were a test squadron, so we were not allowed to deploy unless mm. we were like uh, watching Arabs clean up a base or do IT or something, right. something random like that. Um, but yeah, so any deployments we did was to like Key West, Alaska. <laughs> uh, yeah. We did some red flags, but our pilots don't know how to fight, so they die pretty quickly. Uh, oh. They always came back. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I guess yeah, we're simulated, time. right? That's what you mean, like the simulator. Yeah, it's all, it's all oh. simulated war. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. They, all right. I so can barely was... fly in formation. <laughs> right. So there's there's some pilots out there going, "What the hell?" <laughs> like, you know, it's yeah. simulated, yeah. simulated. Yeah, it's, it's right? all it, it's all simulated. training exercises. Got it. Yeah. 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 So, um, like, so I won't bury the lead a little bit. You were in during the time in which the Air Force and the other branches were kind of going through a restructuring. Um, they were trying to trim down the manning in which each branch really had. And that was during the Obama era of yeah. the, the military. So you got kind of caught up in that whirlwind. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> in 2010, that's when... <coughs> You really saw um, them starting to get a little ridiculous. Um, so they took all of our uh, leads, uh, our seven levels, um, and moved them over to heavies. So it put a lot of strain on us. And then uh, I was caught up in that first wave of force reduction. So pretty much if you had any uh, documentation of anything bad, you're gone. It didn't. Right. Uh, that's when they like uh, quality assurance. Like I got written up once for excessive sand and uh, we're in Florida. There's, there's a beach on base. <laughs> excessive uh, sand, excessive sand. Yes. Was this like in your birthing or like where your barracks room? Is that what you guys No, uh, where we keep our airplanes, it's outside. So excessive sand. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. So okay. 
Yeah, and that's when like our first shirt was no longer a maintainer. Our colonel was no longer um, a maintenance person, uh, and no one on like not only is leaving uh, leaving the military and like you don't like mesh well with normal humans. Like mm. outside of uh, maintenance, like we don't mesh well with other other career other military fields. members. Yeah, right? like they. They don't understand why we never PT. They don't understand like why there's so many DUIs. <laughs> it's like it's a it's a circus. We don't even we call them noners. We don't even like them. Uh, oh, so when so if I can put a navy spin to this, like submariners are just their own version of the navy, right? They yeah. really are. And so be, they have their own separate little subculture within the military. So it sounds like that's, that's what you're kind of explaining is that you guys are your own, your own subculture within the subculture. So yeah. It's funny to me. Right. So you don't even associate with the military members. That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Like we were working 80 hours a week, just like wearing dark blue polyester and a hundred degree heat while some people are wearing khakis and Nikes at the gym, handing out basketballs. And we're just mm. like, they're in honors. Like you're not even in the air force. Get out of my way. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. All right. Yeah. I'm starting to get, I'm starting to track. So, uh, so we talk a lot about how, just how frustrating and alienating the transition process really is. So, largely we make those decisions ourselves as to when to separate. So I, you actually have a separate little trajectory that you go on because you were forced out. That's a little different. That's a, almost like twice as alienating because you almost feel abandoned by the uniform too because you weren't allowed to transition on your terms. Yeah, I signed up for six years, did five years, one month. Um, and the way I found out is uh, I was actually going to cross train. I was going to leave mm. being a crew chief and I was going to be a flight engineer on C-130s. Hmm. And when it came time for my commander to sign the paperwork for me to actually transition, he's like, I don't understand why you went through all this when you're getting out. And I'm like, excuse me. Wow. Um, yeah. So like that, that threw me into a giant, just death spiral of darkness and depression. And uh, that's yeah. when I did start going to a therapist. Cause at that point I didn't care about my job. I didn't care about anything. Yeah. Um, and I just, I was making appointments and I was going there weekly. Um, and I wish I started sooner, honestly. My, yeah. my therapist in there in the Air Force, he was great. Um, but my commander even tried to take away, he tried to get me out on uh, uh, less than honorable, I think it is. Other than honorable? Other than yeah. honorable, yeah. yeah. So I'm like, bro, like, I haven't done anything. Like, mm -hmm. the only... Like the worst thing I did is I forgot to uh, upgrade a uh, condition on the aircraft when I t switched out a light bulb from a, a red diagonal to a red X. And you're trying to take away like my VA benefits and everything like that. Like that's insane. Like it's not like I smuggled cocaine on base or something. Right. Yeah. I, you know, I guess that just adds to the betrayal. It's like yeah. they're trying to, they're trying to get you out and then they're trying to mess you over on the way out. Yeah. I, so, you mentioned to me uh, during this dark period that you had kind of started the mental health process and you first had sought out like a psychiatrist. And so you, they had put you on some medications and, and you, you really weren't adapting well to the medications. They were causing some physiological kind of disruptions. Yeah. And I just mentioned that because in the mental health sphere you know you have psychologists who do largely testing and talk therapy and then you have psychiatrists who are medical doctors who hand out medications to treat mental health issues and then you can have social workers who also do talk therapy uh, licensed clinical social workers so there's just so many different stops in which you could end up being uh in who's ever office and if you don't know that in advance it can be dizzying, you know, you can, you can have the wrong expectation for the wrong professional, so to speak. So I don't want you to talk about anything you're not really willing to talk about, but let's talk about that first step in the psychiatric treatment modality, if you want to. 
Yeah, well, um, eventually, whenever I am a disabled veteran, mm -hmm. um, so um, unfortunately, when I did get out, I didn't have any health care. So right. like I was on my own. So I was like working three jobs, going to school um, and I wasn't taking care of myself. I was hyper burnt out. Mm -hmm. um, and when I try to I kill myself uh, by I was going to drive my van off a bridge. That way, my family can at least collect a life insurance. Yeah. Um, but that's I sought help after that. Um, yeah. The thing that saved me, uh, the the song Oceans by Hillsong United came on, and I just I felt like God was just speaking to me, mm. and I was like, I can't do this. Like this is a betrayal of just everything that I am. So yeah. that's when I reached out to the VA, um, and they they put me on this trajectory. And like you said, like uh, the first guy, he just like hopped me up on all these pills. I was sick all the time. My my brain was in a fog. Mm. Uh, uh, the the serotonin and the medication or the inhibitors. Yeah, the like, SSRIs. Yeah. yeah, the SSRIs. Like they really just jacked me up. Um, so I just played the V8 game and I was like, look, like. I don't want to do this. Like, I don't mm -hmm. want to be all hopped up on pills. Like at w the max I had was 10 medications. I had yeah. 10 pill bottles in my cabinet that I had to take every day. I'm like, I don't, this, this is ridiculous. Like I want to go see a psychotherapist specifically. Yeah. Um, so, they didn't go ahead. Yeah. So I just wanted to, to say, you know, so much we talk about the mental health of, you know, the combat veterans, you know, because they have the PTSD related symptomology, but it's only a very small part of the uniform experience. And when we start talking about the 22 a day and everybody's got an opinion on where this number actually comes from and uh, you know, who actually makes up that 22 a day, like what jobs in the military make up the 22 a day you telling that story, which I, and I appreciate you for sharing it. That took a lot of guts to even talk about it. I, I really do appreciate it. It just shows you that no matter what your experiences is, no matter what your experience in the uniform, excuse me, you can be in some pretty dark places in the transition. And I just kind of wanted to say, you don't have to just fit this prototype or this model of what a veteran looks like due to like combat experiences or being a grunt or whatever, whatever you want to call it. You can look like you, you can have your experiences. And as you kind of just so eloquently put, you went on deployments to, to Key West. Yeah. Your experiences in the uniform can vary. That doesn't mean that there's, you're less, uh, your mental health symptoms are any less impactful to you, right? And it just shows you how complicated our interactions can be. So I just wanted to kind of touch on that and say I appreciate you sharing that, and you are absolutely telling a part of the story that absolutely needs to be told. That it's not just this type of veteran who may have mental health problems or may have mental health struggles. It's all of us. So by all means, please continue. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> with all that, and I hear this story time and time again, because like in my business, I specifically, I want to give back mm -hmm. and I want to help other veterans in their business and diagnose like their problems and try and make them better. Actually yeah. have a, uh, a business that works correctly. And the number one I see, Number one thing I see doesn't matter where, what branch they serve or what they did. We feel alone. Mm -hmm. And um, just, I've, I've told that story so many times and I, I feel so comfortable with it. And I understand when other people like clam up, but I don't want anybody to feel alone. Yeah. yeah. And there's just so many of us that just uh, we felt like nobody cares about us. We're not being taken care of. And, you know, we're not alone. There's millions of us out there and, you know, 
at yeah. two or two that uh, 22 a day like don't do the push-ups call the homies right yeah what are they yeah. up to what are the yeah. people you served with are they still in like give them a phone call yeah 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 because that because i agree the the doing the 22 a day uh 22 push-ups it it was kind of about like the ice bucket challenge, you know, like it's, you know, either supposed to pour this ice bucket no. over your head or donate money. Yeah. Uh, donate the damn money to the ALS. Like who cares about you? Like throwing water on your head on in yeah. the videos, because that's what it kind of happened. But you're right. Like uh, doing this 22 push ups for, you know, veteran suicide awareness, uh, call your buddies, man, check on them, see how they're doing because time kind of just slips away from you and you may, it may be a while before you, you, you check in with people and we kind of have to be conscious of that. So there's something before we started recording that you mentioned that I think is pretty interesting because a lot of veterans feel pretty positively about this guy. And so I wanted, um, I wanted you to, to give an opportunity to kind of speak to it. Um, Jordan Peterson's 12 rules for life an antidote to chaos, which I have read and you have read, um, you found some, some pretty useful tricks, I guess you'd call it, um, for your life in that book. So you want to elaborate a little bit about that? Yeah. Like the main takeaway that I got from it is just the whole, just personal responsibility mm. and just not having this, excuse me, this monolithic thing, right. That's just crushing you. It's like, well, what can you do today that's positive? Mm. You can clean your room. That's not huge, right? Just clean your room. Yeah. And then work your way up from there. Yeah. So I, I did the exact same thing. It's like yeah. I, I cleaned my room. I cleaned my car. Um, I just try and clean up my life the, the best I can. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess what's so <laughs> profound about those little small steps especially whenever you're you're dealing with like depression they really are huge for you i'm yeah. um, just doing a little task to check it off yeah can help you um feel as if you've done something for that day if it if it even if it's just a momentary break in the in the the heavy so to speak and there is some kind of very conventional wisdom understanding what you can control in your life and if you can just do one little thing um you can all victory yeah even if it's just for the day yeah yeah because um just being in deep depression like just getting out of bed yeah was a small victory because you just want to lay there and not exist and you know, a lot of times i think there's some misconceptions about depression it's not just a, a depressed mood. It's not just yeah. being blue. You're right. There is at times people feel just completely unable to move. Like everything is exhausting. Um, being it, there's a, there's a, a insomnia and a hypersomnia that kind of happens at the same time. It's like, you can't get good sleep, but all you want to do is sleep. Right. Yeah. And I think if, if people understood that a little bit better, they may cut some people a little bit more slack about when it comes to depression it's not just get out of it like shake out of it you can't just it's a it's a major life change that you have to kind of make incrementally when with dealing with depression because it's a self kind of uh fulfilling prophecy in a lot of ways like people who are depressed you reach out to them you text them and you, you say hey buddy you want to go grab some pizza well people who are depressed um, they often don't want to do that. They don't want nope. to do anything, right? And so they they say no. They feel terrible about saying no because they feel guilty about it too. And then they inadvertently isolate themselves from people. And then they feel alone even more so, right? So it kind of just, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, prophecy. They retreat from others. And then people stop reaching out to them because they get told no after you know a dozen times and that just makes them feel even worse yeah. so understanding that if you're dealing with somebody who's a little depressed or who has depression you can't take their saying no to your invitation to go do something personally it's really um it's an effort for them to even get out of bed like you said 
So just keep reaching out to them. Just yeah. keep connecting to them as much as you can, reinforcing the idea that you're here for them. You know that they're struggling and you're not pulling away from them. You're still pursuing them. And that can be a little exhausting at times. And I understand that, but that really is the way to break through to them is just to continue to pursue them because in their head, they're thinking things like nobody cares about me. Yep. Nobody loves me. Yep. See, they didn't, they don't even text me anymore. They don't love me. They don't care about me. And that's the lies that, that kind of go on inside of your head. It's not true. We all know it's not true, but while you're in, while you're engulfed in it, boy, it feels true. Yeah. Oh yeah. So was there, you said just doing the small things from 12 rules for life. Was there anything else that you found particularly useful there? Uh, once I, that really got me on a trajectory to go see a psychotherapist. Mm. Yeah. And that just made the world a difference because I'm not on pills anymore. I'm just, I'm talking to a human mm. who is drawing um, this stuff out of me that yeah. you 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 didn't know was there yeah um and they're really like they're jumping in into the dark hole with you yeah. and they're they're walking with you to mm -hmm. get out of that darkness and and yeah. really calling out the horrible dark things that are going through in your mind like you said yeah. no one loves me i'm worthless i'm a yeah. piece of crap yeah. like the the military didn't even want me yeah. Like that's how worthless I am. And yeah. they're like, no, that it's not accurate. No, it's yeah. not true. So, so, like, can I ask you though, is your provider a veteran? No, she is not. Her husband is though. Okay. So she has some tangential connection to the community. Yes. You know, a lot of times I hear, well, Ryan, I don't want to go talk to, I'll talk to you, man, but I don't want to talk to, you know, somebody who's not a veteran. They don't understand me. Has that been your, has that been your experience? Do you I've, feel as if your provider doesn't understand you because they're not a veteran? No, I don't yeah. feel that way at all. Yeah. I think she gets it, especially like where where I live, we're heavily military. Mm -hmm. So uh, the VA is always sending people to her. So she really yeah. gets it. And, well, you know, to kind of channel Jordan Peterson too, because he's kind of, uh, he utilizes the narrative kind of approach as well. There's something therapeutic about having to contend with your story and explain it to somebody else, a relative stranger, somebody who doesn't have a connection to the military culture. So you may see that as a negative to say, oh, well, my provider doesn't, is not a, a veteran, but there's something therapeutic about having to explain it and formulate it in a way where you can communicate it to another person. There's some insight that you can gain from your own process by communicating your story to somebody else and not having those cultural um, connections like prior service providers, for example. So I think there's, I think there's something to that. And I, I don't largely kind of shy away from providers that are not military connected because you know, like I said, there's a lot of therapeutic gains that can be made by just explaining yourself to somebody. And uh, honestly, it's less about them and more about you. Right. Like, just yeah. getting just getting you to talk yeah. like that's hard enough when you're like hyper depressed and now you're talking to a stranger. Yeah. And like you need to break out of that and like. Your, your story is valuable and you need to tell it and mm -hmm. you need to like expound and like think about all of those things, all those thoughts and like realize just how like dumb it sounds when you say it, when it comes out of your mouth and it's no longer in your head, like just whispering. Yeah. And I'm glad you said that because being in a therapeutic alliance like that, it's not like a regular relationship. You know, when you're talking to your buddy, it's reciprocal. It's, it's two way, right? There's things that you may not want to talk to me about, you know, trouble you're having with your spouse, for example, because you may be worried that uh, as me, as your buddy, I may go, Oh man, like, I don't want, you know, my buddy to not think well of my spouse. Right. 
So uh, they may, you may shrink away from telling your buddies, you know, these parts that you may be struggling with, but when it's a therapist, they don't talk about them. You only talk about you. It is a one way relationship. There is no expectations. There's no um, vested uh, outcomes that they have in your decisions. They just help you facilitate the decisions in your own life. There is no expectation coming from the other side of the room. It's all, well, what do you think we should do? Or what do you think you should do? There's not any, because, you know, friends try to help, you know, they'll go, well, listen, man, it's really messed up that, you know, they're treating you that way. But you still love and care about your spouse that you you don't want to hear that kind of feedback. So, yeah. you know, in a therapy session, that's not what happens. And I think just understanding that kind of takes a lot of the pressure out of it and that you can be selfish because it's only about you. It's mm -hmm. not about the therapist. It's only about you. So I'm glad you mentioned that because I've been trying to find a way to broach that really. Uh, and and you just gave me that perfect end. Thanks. That's what I'm here for. I'll be <laughs> yeah, here all week, right. guys. Yeah, that's nice. Uh, so uh, you know, it's funny. Let's let's introduce a little levity there, since you kind of did already. You have a tattoo. Let's, let's hear it. Oh yeah. Uh, there we go. There we go. I got a Dragon Ball tattoo. Right. Uh, it's Goku holding uh, the four star Dragon Ball, which is from his grandfather, and it's my very first tattoo. I'm starting a sleeve. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just, you know, the tattoo artist is doing her thing and I'm just hanging out and I'm looking at her cabinets and she's got a lot of cool stickers. And as a mechanic uh, in aviation, like people cover their toolboxes and stickers, uh, not in the military, but more in the civilian side. Yeah. yeah. So like I like stickers. So I'm just looking at her and then all of a sudden the tattoo artist is in my face and I look to my right and my wife is crying. I had passed out for 30 seconds. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Oh and I had God. like, there was, there was no lag time between like me looking at stickers and then a human being being in my face. Cause I was oh, about wow. to topple forward and fall on my face. Did and my eat, wife, did you eat that day? No, that's <laughs> why. Not. Yeah. It, well, so again, of course I have some ink myself. It's a, it's a pretty, uh, pretty good piece of advice to make sure you eat a little something and make sure you have plenty of hydration in you before you go get a tattoo. Yeah. I had no idea <laughs> that like your body just goes into shock, <laughs> but I love telling all my, all my veteran buddies about that. Cause there's like, Oh, you're such a girl. Like you can't even get a little <laughs> tattoo when you pass out. And well, it's, it, it is your first one too. So it makes it a little funnier too. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I'm I'm glad that that was a pretty humorous little anecdote there. And and now that we've kind of talked about some of the uh, the more difficult trials that you had coming out of the uniform, and obviously you've transcended those. Um, so I I don't want to to go without spotlighting the fact that in the midst of all of this, you got a bachelor's, you got a master's degree, and now you run your own business. You know, it's not, I just want to say that's a testament of just fortitude and strength of a person who is going through all of this, feels rejected and, and cast out by the uniform, which we all do. But you, you actually can say, you guys kicked me out. You let you made me go because we all feel that way. We all feel that loss. Anyway, we feel that alienation, that ostracization that happens after the uniform. And so with some of the things that happened right, right after your time in the uniform or as you were exiting the uniform, you had every reason in the world to go, well, is me. I'm not, yep. I'm shrinking away and I'm not, I'm not interacting with the world anymore. But even in this, this darkest of trials, you were successful, man. And I have to applaud you for that. And I'm not just gassing you up, so to speak. There's because uh, you know a lot of times with that with a mic, we talk about some shit, some serious heavy shit. But you know, the whole part of the interview is to spotlight people who are who are coming over this, like just transcending all of these problems, just finding a way to endure and find meaning and purpose in life after it, or maybe even through it. So I just wanted to take a, 
a quick moment there to to brag on you a little bit. Oh, yeah. and <laughs> I know to brag on you a little bit and to say, hey, you know, people can endure and make it through. These are these are positive stories that we're hearing about too. It's not just all about the doom and the gloom, man. There's there's light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. Oh yeah, and one of the things that are I'll I'll give three points on that is one you need friends that mm. not only you can be completely and totally transparent with, mm -hmm. but they'll call you out on your bullshit. <laughs> That's huge. Social feedback, yeah, I got yeah. It. yeah. Cause like a lot of, a lot of people, um, like you said, like they'll take your side. You don't need that. Yeah. You know, like, ah, oh, that doesn't sound right. Are you sure that's what happened? It's like, nah, yeah. bro, you're lying to me. Like you really need that in your life. Um, in the Bible, uh, there's a really good relationship between two friends, uh, King David and Jonathan and Jonathan's dad was trying to kill David because David was, uh, crowned by God to be the next king and was going to take over Jerusalem. Um, but they have like this great budding relationship. Um, and you really need that in your life. You need to find out at least one guy. Uh, if you're a man, if you're a woman, uh, let it be one woman that is like that. And other things that you have to do, you got to be like plugged into your community. For mm -hmm. me, I'm into my biblical community. I'm plugged yeah. into my church. Right. Um, I have a men's group that I go to. And I'm also plugged into the business community. I'm part of my local chamber of commerce. Um, I'm part of the young professionals for the chamber of commerce. Mm -hmm. And something else that I do is I play a card game with my veteran friends. And we have a YouTube channel. It's called Killing Villains. We play DC <laughs> Deck Builder every Saturday. Killing Villains. Yeah, right. and we just like uh, you know how we are, a bunch of veterans getting together. It's just three hours of us like razzing on each other and talking <laughs> the most hilarious shit. I wouldn't, shit in the whole I wouldn't know Earth. what you were talking about at all. No. <laughs> yeah, well, we keep yeah. it family friendly, but yeah. for the most part, we say some horrible things to each other. <laughs> but it's all <laughs> love. <laughs> yeah, you know, because you know that is a part of the, I guess, the military culture and the veteran culture is, you know, we do have a sense of gallows humor. We have a pretty dark yeah. sense of humor about things. And, you know, that's totally culturally appropriate for us. That's totally on brand. So they say, um, now there's something else you talked about, um, before we started recording too, um, about how you, you stay kind of connected with the veteran identity as well. You, you make conscious efforts to go out and do like physical activities with people as well. Like you, I think you mentioned that you go camping and, and yeah. do kind of some outdoor stuff with your other veteran buddies. That's huge. Um, because one of the things that really distracts us, we all have our phones and our devices and stuff mm. and camping sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it really like it's good it's therapeutic because you're out in nature and that's a scientific fact of just being out in nature and like unplugging from everything just like leaps and bounds is just good for you mm. and it reminds me of just like embracing the suck back when i was in and doing it with mm. my veteran buddies one guy's still in he's a gearing beret um oh yeah he's he must be a a real a real pushover huh yeah yeah real pushover he can only eat me across the forest <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. like we do it together and like right. we, we bring our kids and let them experience like uh we did one camping trip where all we ate was mres and we taught the kids how to like heat up an mre and like which ones are good and which ones suck and like piecing <laughs> together stuff and like it's just continuing that like uh, just embracing the suck together and just yeah. being in, in community and just being together. Yeah. Uh, you know, misery loves company. So they say, yeah. they say right. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny. It's like uh, you're almost, you said you're doing it with your children too, that you're almost like socializing them into the military culture as well. You yeah. know, it's, it's like a more hardcore version of the boy scouts, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, this is fascinating, man. So, what exactly got you into the business that you're doing now? Because I know how our paths first crossed. 
you know, we were kind of just palling around through some Facebook groups and, you know, you reached out and said, Hey man, you know, I like what you're doing. Is there, is there anything I can do to help your business grow? Which, I mean, if you can call this podcast a business, so to speak. Um, and of course, you know, that's whenever we started talking. So is it, do you normally seek out relationships within the business, uh, the veteran business world? Yeah. Cause not only is being a veteran lonely cause you don't like relate to normal people mm. being a business owner is lonely cause you can't just talk to your friend about it. They have no idea like why Sarah and accounting is like jacking you up and like you're, <laughs> the, you're, um, you're losing money like you're stressed out. Like they don't, they can't relate cause they're not doing it. They're working a nine to five. Right. So I saw that as like a double edged sword and I'm like, man, like I can't, I got to give back. So like, that's why I try and focus on veteran business owners. Cause mm -hmm. like we have something that we can relate to. And now like, honestly, like, I just want to help you. Like you're not alone. Like, you have some problems and you, it's, it's really hard to read the label from inside the bottle. So you, you're just in it. So you don't know. Right. And I'm, okay. and I'm outside. That's, that's an awesome metaphor. Yeah. 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 I, I'm outside. So it's easier for me to diagnose what's going on. I was like, Oh, you just need to fire this person. I'm like, yeah. And my big thing is like, it's always just community. Community mm. is so important. Like, we're all we're in the, we're in this together. We're trying to help people and just be better. And we're we're not one against another. Like we can work together. Like we're yeah. part of this community. Yeah, yeah, and it, that is so true too. And then, like I said, that's a pretty apt way of describing it. You can't read the label from inside the bottle, and that is so accurate. All you need is perspective, right? Just a different vantage point, and that yeah. can be really helpful whenever you're immersed. um which kind of brings me to another part you know when you mentioned culture um and just to kind of go back to a little bit you know we in the uniform are just so diverse i mean there are jobs in in the military where it's almost a 25 percent equal ratio or proportion across the different racial categories has that been something moving out of the uniform that has impacted your life i mean going from this really cohesive social unit where we don't really care about you know what color my brother's skin is they're just my brother right and then interacting again in the world outside of the uniform where all of a sudden that matters again yeah i always like the um... What's that quote? There's no racism in the military. There's only dark green and light green. Yeah. Oh, uh, or just all, you're all shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you're all it. trash. You're all yeah. worthless. Yeah. But, um, like I'm Dominican. My family's a hundred percent from Dominican Republic. I was the first generation American and just out and about people like, I know just around here, everybody's military. So like, if you just assume you're probably correct, someone's a right, veteran. Yeah. But like, even when I'm outside of my community and I go home, back home to like Massachusetts or something like that, like the way I carry myself, it's very evident yeah. um, that I am, that I did serve or something. There's just something about me. So like somebody comes up and makes me feel very uncomfortable when they're like, Hey, thank you for your service. I'm like, Oh, right. we thank all feel you. that way. Right? <laughs> um, but yeah, <laughs> but one, I mean, I never told any of my family that I was highly depressed because mm -hmm. as a Hispanic person, like we don't, we don't talk about that. Probably get a flip flop thrown at you. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> We've all seen the TikTok videos, right? La yeah. Chancla. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, and that is true. Um, there, there may be extra cultural pressures that kind of define our mental health in unique ways too. Um, it may not be as, I guess you'd say, um, endorsed in some, in some groups of people to talk about things that are, that are bothering you, uh, psychologically. So that, that kind of can inform our decision-making process too, as we're, 
we're moving into whether or not we should interact with the VA, for example, because we all have to kind of overcome the, the burdens and the barriers to receive care. Generally speaking, whether it's geographical locations, you have to drive 45 minutes to get to a, a facility to see, receive care from the VA. But it's in, it's interesting to hear somebody who has an internal barrier too of, well, it's just not really our custom to talk about this stuff. And so that almost a- adds an extra layer of stigma to it. It's like, well, I can't even talk to my family about, you know, what I'm struggling with too. Yeah. I mean, while I was in, like you're a piece of garbage if you got a doctor's appointment for something because you got work to do. And then which, like. Uh, yeah. I, which I'm glad you mentioned that because that is so. Stupid. It's just, well, it is. And it's such a common experience we all have, whether it's. You know, uh, my back hurts. I need to go. I need to go to medical and see what the hell is going on. Or if it's something like that, I've spoke of before too. If somebody was, you know, when we all leave home with the holidays coming up, for example, and you're maybe you're a young twenty year old, maybe you're a young man in in your early twenties, and you're away from home for the first time during the holidays, that's going to make you feel some kind of way, right? And we all have to adjust in our own ways. And I saw people just get completely shit on by the, the, the chain of command for wanting to speak up and talk to somebody at medical about, you know, struggling to adapt to being away from home during this, these hard times of the holidays. And that really sticks with you when you see somebody get treated that way. It's almost the only thing you can think of it's just such a chilling effect you're just like you see you're standing in a formation you're just like man i know i'm not gonna say anything see what just happened to that guy i'm not gonna say anything and one year of course one year we had christmas canceled in my squadron oh wow wow it's too much sand yeah we got we got put on 12s oh man it was brutal (laughs) yeah um in the navy we call that every holiday we're, yeah. we're always on port and starboard yeah yeah it was um it was yeah. hilarious we even had the fourth yeah. of july canceled one time. <laughs> yeah you know in my job we were always essential personnel so we never got all the cool 96s and everything else we were just always on shift it sucked but you know I, I i think that's something that we kind of bring to the table you know as veterans we we bring this these I guess these misapprehensions about the mental health process and reprisal and, and cause you, you just said you had a positive experience with mental health while you were in the uniform, which is something that we don't hear a lot about. Most of the time we hear stories of somebody says something, the provider has to tell the chain of command because they've said something that maybe puts the mission at risk and then that person just walks with the rest of, well, until they have something that changes that opinion, thinking that you can't trust mental health providers because of that interaction. But you actually offered up an example to the contrary, which I appreciate. Yeah. If, if you're still in and you're listening to this, like whatever your leadership says, like tell them to write you up and go anyways, like mm-hmm. just walk just walk over to legal and show them this and then just be like, yo, like this ain't right. Cause, yeah. um, regardless of what the mission is, like if you're not alive, it literally doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. They will replace you in a heartbeat. Um, That's true. but you can't be replaced as a father. You can't be replaced as a husband, as a son, whatever, like in that area, you can't be replaced. And if you're so down, that you do something horrible and you just give in to the war within like yeah. you're all those people were like, man, like he was talking to me about this like a month ago and I just called him a piece of shit and then he killed himself. And then I was like, Oh yeah. Like it, yeah. The, it, 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 it's, it's like a pebble in a pond. So like, yeah. forget about all that stupidity. Just go, go talk to them. And if you don't like your therapist, go find somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad you bring that, bring that up as well is 
you know, you're not a bad patient or a bad client if you don't vibe well with your provider. You know, the realities that come into play too. And we call it therapeutic alliance. So sometimes, yeah, I, I may have been a little delay there. there so goes. sometimes there is just a, a poor fit between provider and client. And you just have to do something uh, to address that. And they may not be the right provider for you. That doesn't mean you should stop yeah. seeking out treatment. It doesn't mean that you're a problem. It, it just means that you and that provider may not have been the best suited for each other. And going to another provider might just completely make that obvious to you if you, if you go to, if you continue to seek treatment. So I'm glad you said that as well. Thank you. You're just, you're setting me, you're teeing me up, man, for so many great <laughs> points. You're like the, you're the best wingman ever right now. Ooh. Wait, wait you, you guys, that's what, that's what yeah. you guys are called, right? Wingman? No, right? no, we're airmen. No, but that's what you, like, we call each other shipmates, and that's what you nope. guys call each Never leave an guys... airman behind. No, like, okay, so Those what do you pilots. call an... Those are what pilots you... that are wingmen. What do you call another Air Force service member? Airmen. Like, okay, so I was at Lackland Air Force Base for my A school, and there was definitely something written on the wall that said something like never leave another wingman behind or something like that. That the airman's creed. I, maybe. Uh, I don't know, man. I wasn't in the air no. force. I'll never leave an airman behind and I will not fail. I think that was the last two lines. Something like I that. I just remember in, in, while I was there, you guys had this weird. Uh, <laughs> uh, our and, stupid uh, battle cry. <laughs> yeah. Alta, alta, alta flight, a symbol. <laughs> but you guys had the best food, so I guess it makes up for it. Right? Oh yeah, oh that French toast at Lackland, whoo girl. <laughs> mm. Still dream funny. about it to this day. <laughs> That's funny. I don't think I ever have that experience in the Navy ever. There is nothing from the Navy food that I will ever think about ever again because it was that rough. That's why I like that meme where it's like uh, somebody asked a question. Uh, There's a spider in your tent. Uh, what do you do? It's like the Navy says, oh, I'll squish it. There's like the Army said, oh, I'll, I'll eat it. And the Army or the Air Force person is like, why is there a tent in my room? <laughs> <laughs> Call room service. Yeah. I. This was actually, you know, when people ask me about joining – I, I usually say, well, if I knew what I knew now, I probably would have been in the Air Force. Um, because while my last duty station, Odyssey Dawn was going on, so Libya was was popping off. And yeah. so we had Marines and uh, airmen that were there. Now, these guys, the airmen, did the exact same job as me. They were trained to do the exact same thing. And the Marines and the, the sailors were living in the barracks, and the airmen had to, to move into our barracks and they got paid an extra $600 a month because our barracks were not good enough for the airmen. Damn. I didn't Sub know about all that. Substandard living allowance. That's awesome. Hand to God. <laughs> like I went, are you kidding me? Substandard living. Allowance. Me and the, you know, me and the Marines looking at each other like, are you Look at this. Like, are you kidding me? So some stereotypes about the Air Force is true, man. They do take oh, yeah. care of you a lot better. I'll take it. Whatever. I don't want to sleep under a Humvee and be covered in fleas. Get out of here. <laughs> I need air conditioning. <laughs> That's funny. So I we, guess, uh, yeah, go ahead. Even in our, uh, we call it, when I was going through basic training, it was called Warrior Week. And now it's like, it's two weeks now or something. I don't know. Oh, it's not um, a day, not a week. Okay. <laughs> it, it was it, it was a week, a whole week. And like my air conditioner during our battle training was so cold. You could hang meat in there. Oh my god. You goodness. needed like three blankets. Oh my god. You're not helping the Air Force image right now. We're good. So, so let me let me ask you, is there anything else you want to get we want to cover here? I mean, we're reaching in about 50 minutes here. No, just uh, seek help. Find you a good therapist. It's not. Don't be ashamed of it. Um, call call the homies, and that's about it. 
that is a great synopsis. All right. So if you have enjoyed the conversation that I've had here with Irving and you feel as if you know somebody would benefit from listening to this conversation, please spread the word. Let everybody know what we're doing here with Vet with a Mic because we really largely rely on the word of mouth that you all provide to help spread this mission. So if there is a topic that you feel like would be of a particular interest here on Vet with a Mic, please reach out to me on all the social media accounts. I'm on all of them. And let me know some ideas that you think would be great to have talked about here on Vet with a Mic. But as always, however life finds you, I hope life finds you well. Till next time. 